Good afternoon and welcome to the Fresh Expressions live conversation. This is part two um, of the conversations about the Missio Day in a digital age and we're talking about evangelism in a digital age um, today. So thank you to all my guests uh, for joining me. If you're joining um, live then it'd be great if you could say hello tell us where you're joining us from and also um to do like share your stories and ask questions as we're talking and um, we've got some very clever people here today so i want some really hard questions just to really challenge them uh, that'd be great um so yeah thank you yeah thank you so much to um, all of you for joining us today um to start with, uh, I just I'm just going to introduce myself, and then we'll do some introductions around the, the virtual room. Um, so I'm Lizzie. Uh, I work for Fresh Expressions um, in their communications, and um, I live in Liverpool. And I co-lead Story House, that is a, an independent coffee shop, a charity, and a Fresh Expression of Church. And so we'll, I'm going to go around. Steve, I would, first of all, can you introduce yourself? Tell us where you are and what you're doing. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Hollinghurst. Uh, I live in Sutton Coalfield on the edge of Birmingham because my wife is a bishop in the Diocese of Birmingham. I actually work for the next door Diocese of Lichfield, where I'm an evangelism enabler with an environmental focus. Wow, fantastic. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so Thank you. much. Um, and then Rachel, um, do, yeah, where are you and what are you doing? Hi, I'm Rachel. Uh, I am in London. I'm the executive director of Hope Together, and I'm uh, married to uh, church six years ago here in Shoreditch, uh, part of the Anglican Church, Christ Church. So, living in community and um, yeah, loving being part of a church plant. Fantastic! And can you tell us a bit about what Hope Together is about? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, that's that's probably two. Yeah, Hope Together. Uh, mm -hmm. We basically resource local churches in mission and evangelism. Brilliant, fantastic. And then we have Frida all the way from, from Sweden, which is fantastic. We've got international. Um, yeah, uh, tell us tell us about yourself. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm Frida Manifet. Uh, I'm a pastor in the Lutheran Church of Sweden, uh, but also uh, a PhD student in practical theology with church history at the University College of Stockholm. Uh, but I also uh, work part time as a researcher and teacher at Lund University in the south of Sweden, where I am right now, close to the border of beautiful Denmark. Wow, amazing! Wow, that's that's a lot of. It sounds like you're quite busy. Um, there's a lot of different things that you're involved in. But it's so fantastic yeah. to have you with us today. And then we have John. Um, yeah, John, introduce mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, I'm John. I live in Glasgow, in Scotland. I uh, was recently described in another webinar as a theologian in the wild, which um, I rather liked, actually. Um, <laughs> I've often described myself as a spiritual entrepreneur. I'm a professor, a minister, um, and I'm about to start teaching a course with my wife, Olive, for full of seminary in the US on um, how to cope with being a Christian and the church through this whole COVID pandemic business and, and what comes next. Oh, wow. That sounds fantastic. Um, yeah. Any tips would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> um, but I yeah, no, that's I the questions. I'm not sure about the answers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And so what we're going to do um, this afternoon is basically... Um, so Steve, Frieda and John, you've all contributed to a book that was released, um, I think it was December last year, 
um, uh, called Missy A Day in a Digital Age. Um, so you, oh, we've got copies, excellent. And uh, there is a discount at the top of the live feed. If you do want to buy a copy of the book, um, you can get a special discount today um, for, for the next couple of weeks. Um, and Rachel, there was, it, this book came from a conference um, that you spoke at as well about the mission of God in, in a digital age. So this is kind of why we, we have, we're having this conversation. You guys have spent a lot of time thinking about it, researching um and you know a lot you've got a lot of examples to share and uh i think it's it's fantastic to have this conversation in a sense when covid hit everyone had to respond very quickly and do something but maybe we didn't have a lot of time to think uh <laughs> theologically about it or or you know about what was actually happening what was going on and what what we were doing as we were communicating um more through digital space um so i think it's it's just a really great time to to have this conversation and so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of um, my guests to kind of present um, some of their reflections on the mission of God in in a digital um, age and uh, as they're talking do do put some questions up um, and then and then we're going to just have a conversation about some of the topics that come up and also talking about some examples so Steve you are your first up you just you've offered to go first which is very brave um, so uh, yeah do yeah it'd be great to hear from you to give us some of your reflections well, well, first, I think there's a video we're going to have a look at. So, Lizzie, if you want to, to bring that up, this comes from a Dutch website. Cool. I would like to share a story with you about a girl. This girl was from Holland and she was about 20 years old when this all started. She was raised in a non-Christian family. They never went to church. They owned two Bibles, but they were never taken off the bookshelf. The girl went to university. And around that time, she started asking herself questions. Questions like, who am I? What am I doing here on earth? What is life worth living for? Is it all meaningless? Before she knew it, she got depressed. She didn't want to admit her situation. At the same time, she began to notice the fate of some Christian friends. There was something they had that she admired, something that made her curious. The girl was a little bit shy to admit that. She always said she didn't believe those things. She didn't know where to turn to. She was curious about the Christian faith and she had these important life questions, but she didn't dare to share those with her friends. On a Sunday she was sitting at home and she felt like doing something with those questions which had been dominating her life for quite a while then. That afternoon she went on the internet. She opened Google and typed in searching God. Immediately, Google gave some results. At the top of the page there was iksukgod.nl, which is translated uh, knowinggod.net. She clicked on the page and she uh, read the things about God and Jesus. And even though she didn't understand everything, it looked like these were the things she had been searching for. She went to the last page. On that page there was a prayer and she prayed. Maybe most of you already guessed it. That girl was me. The same night I visited the webpage, I signed up for an alpha course. After the third evening, I began to understand it more, and I decided that I believed it all. I started to know God in a personal way. I found a church, I slowly started to grow, and I got baptized. I became an e-coach, so I can help others with their questions. Now, three years later, me and my husband were working for Agape. We're working on the student ministry on campus. I'll refer to that in a bit in what I'm saying. It's a story that illustrates some of the ways the internet can reach people. And of course, the irony is that that is in itself an evangelistic video. I approach this subject very much as a missiologist working across cultures in an intercultural way. And so I start with the assumption that how we communicate always changes what we communicate. And therefore, discovering how digital media affects communication is key to thinking about it in evangelism. What we cannot do is assume that 
digital media simply is the same as communicating face to face. So those questions are kind of key to me. Now, there are some interesting things in Kimberly's story. One of the things is the very normal human thing of at certain stages of life asking key important questions. Then there was the interaction between online and offline, if you can call them that way. And, and the way she was impressed by Christian friends, but didn't want to talk to them, but instead ended up researching faith online through a website. And one of the things that research tells us is that many people want to explore new things and new ideas anonymously. If you've been running online church services during the recent pandemic, you may well have found, as many have, that you have people visiting your services who do not normally go to your church. And this is exactly the reason why they're doing that. That anonymity enables them to do something that would be quite scary for them in real life, stepping through the door of your church when, it's, when you're having a worship service. But then after that, as well as following the web founder and finding a website that she found really helpful and helped her to understand more, she ended up signing up for an alpha course and joining a local church rather than perhaps joining an internet faith community or an internet church. And I think that shows the way our lives lived in the world fit with what's going on in our digital communication. And I think this reflects some ways that thinking about the digital has changed in those who explore this. In the early days, we used to talk about cyberspace and cyberspace religion, whereas increasingly that's moved to thinking about online and then digital. And I've changed my thinking as a missiologist. So when I was approaching this subject uh, in, in the 1990s and, and, and uh, early noughties, I very much used to think of the internet as a place that one went to to share faith and plant churches, rather like a new housing estate. I no longer think that's the case. I think it's best seen as a communication tool between people in their local communities and contexts. But what it does do, I think very importantly, unlike broadcast media like TV, is it becomes highly interactive. And that can happen whether you're in a social media group, a video conference, or indeed online gaming. That interactivity enables genuine conversation to happen. And I think that's the key to what's going on when we're thinking about uh, digital evangelism. I think there are one or two points about digital communication that I, I think are very important. That anonymity we were talking about also extends to social media groups. Indeed, what we're doing now, we do not have a clue who is listening to our conversation. And you always have to bear in mind the hidden listeners as you communicate. Then there's a thing that's often called disinhibition. Uh, this basically is that because digital media puts us one stage removed as we communicate, it can become very easy to think that the people we're communicating with are not really there. Now, this even happens on video conferencing because you cannot see the nonverbal communication that makes up a lot of how we communicate face to face, but is especially true in social media groups, which are text based, because you cannot see the people you're communicating with. And it's very easy, therefore, to treat them differently to how you would face to face. Now, this can lead to some positive things. In some ways, it makes it easier to share faith online because actually you don't have those same inhibitions to doing so, but also can make it possible to do so very offensively. Uh, you can do hit and run evangelism or get into aggressive arguments very easily online in a way that you wouldn't in a face to face context. It is also a global communication. So as well as communicating with people, you're communicating with them in their local context and culture. And that has to be borne in mind as well. The Internet also has an ability to draw people from across the world with particular niche interests and particular worldviews. And therefore, it can sometimes create a new tribalism that can be divisive, but also means there are places where you can build deep relationships with people who share your interests. And I would say that actually the key to thinking about sharing faith through digital media is to build relationships within affinity groups where you are at home and can share faith personally with your personal story, rather than think of preaching on Internet platforms to people you do not know.
I think lastly, I want to say that, you know, the whole conference was about Missio Dei and the idea that God goes ahead of us in mission. So God is already working in the internet communities we join before we get there. And just as in any form of missiology, I think the key question is, where is God at work? Where do I hear God asking the questions and building the bridges through which we can share faith? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, it's so helpful to kind of think of God already at work um, in that digital space. I think some a lot of churches we, we may have thought, oh, well, we've just arrived there in the past year, but actually he's already been at work um, and there were there's there's already people connecting and finding faith as we've seen in that video um before it happens <laughs> like it's not like we've discovered it before he has um we will say there's a question here um there's a couple of questions about if there's a link for the video that you share is is there a do you know if there's a link Steve? Well, there is. yeah there is um it, it's i'll see if i can find it and post it into the comments Cool, thank you. If not, we can. Um, I could I could upload it to like our YouTube channel or something and create it later on. But yeah, we've seen you. We will definitely make sure we can share as it is a fantastic story and so helpful and a great thing I think for people to to share to inspire them as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that, Steve. Um, so now, John, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, on on this degree. I'll just um, one second. We go. Great. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Lizzie. Well, 12 months ago, I signed up for uh, what I thought was going to be a very local volunteering group, which was asking for people to do things like deliver groceries or prescriptions to people who were housebound. And uh, as well as doing my bit with that, I also suggested that I could offer spiritual support thinking that um, that would probably go down like a lead balloon with the organisers. Well, I'm not going to tell you the whole story because we'd be here for the whole hour listening to it. But if I tell you that 12 months later, I've got a group of something like 2,000 unique individuals who've been referred to me through that group because it just went viral across the whole of uh, Scotland where I live, not just in my local area. And uh, one of the things that I've discovered in ministering online is, um, well, actually something I've known for a long time, that it's all about context, context and context. And if we were in a media studies class right now, we'd be talking no doubt about that famous statement by Marshall McLuhan um, about the medium being the message. And I think one of the things I've realized over the last 12 months is that in terms of evangelism and mission, we often start with the message and give very little thought at all to the medium. Whereas in the online environment, the medium is absolutely where we need to start. Um, it's something that's a challenge in relation to mission more generally, of course, but the reality is that if the message is to be received, let alone acted upon and, and accepted, context and culture are absolutely dominant. So I started thinking in advance of today about the various um, media that are available to us in the online environment. Uh, websites have been around for a long time, as have blogs. And then, of course, the social media. And it strikes me that a lot of Christians are happier in some contexts than they are in others, partly because those three that I've just mentioned serve different purposes. And to a very large extent, I would suggest connect with different people groups. So that brings together for me two different things, the media that we're going to use and the people groups that we think we might reasonably connect with. And knowing who we wish to communicate with and the most effective medium for doing that is always going to be a starting point. So far, so unusual. So usual nothing new in any of that. I've said it loads of times long before we had this conversation about what uh, online digital church might look like. It's about contextualization, if you want to use a word that would be more familiar to people. But then as I started thinking about what I've been doing in the last 12 months, within these broad categories, there are multiple small categories as well. 
that also require the message to be shaped differently. And that's particularly the case in social media. So, for example, if you're wanting to evangelize or share the good news on TikTok, for example, you're going to need a completely different approach and totally different materials than if you're doing it on Facebook, partly because of the nature of the medium and also because of the nature of the people who mostly connect with those two that I've chosen. And then, of course, neither of those is the same as Instagram. So you need a different set of parameters there as well, not to mention WhatsApp, Twitter, and no doubt loads of others that I've never heard of, um, and others that will be coming on stream even as we speak. Um, so what I've discovered is that these are actually different contexts, not just with different ways of presenting material and sharing your own story, but actually for the most part, connect with different people groups. And in each of these environments, this is something I think we've learned in thinking about mission for some considerable time now, in order to communicate the gospel effectively in these different environments, the message needs to be different in each of them, just because we want it to be the same in the kind of impact and the challenge that it is received with as people connect with us. Well, I'm probably going to have the chance to talk about more specifically some of the things that I've done later on in relation to those 2,000 people who've been uh, referred to me, as it were. Um, but there are just a couple of things I want to uh, mention here before, just as a sort of conversation starters in a sense. I think that regardless of these different platforms that we might be using, it is the case that the things that interest church people on the whole are not going to connect missionally. A simple example of that would be that the way that if you look at any church website, for example, or a blog particularly, but also their Facebook pages and so on, it's quite likely that there will be great prominence given to this is our statement of beliefs. Now, quite frankly, that is a tribal identification mark that we are sending out from my church or your church to say, this is where we belong in the grand scheme of Christian tradition. Frankly, nobody else that I've come across is the slightest bit interested in all of that. And in fact, I've come across quite a few people who go to visit a church website in particular read the statements of belief and think, well, if that's the gospel, it's definitely not for me. So we need to get our heads around the reality that the things we like to talk about on social media are not actually likely, they're not all that likely to connect with anyone other than probably disillusioned Christians. But the other thing, and this is perhaps more important still, is if you're thinking about evangelism in the digital environment, do not underestimate the importance of simple things. I mentioned that I'm in, I've been in touch with something like 2,000 people. To be honest, I stopped counting after 800. Uh, so it's a guess that I must be up to 2,000 now. Um, but the top of the agenda with these people has been simple, traditional Christian disciplines about prayer and spirituality. I lost count long ago of the number of people who were saying, teach me to pray. How can I pray? Is it OK to pray if I don't know whether I have any faith? If I get it wrong, will the God I'm not sure I believe in zap me or will some horrible thing happen to me? Just teach me how to be in touch with somebody or something that is bigger than me. So the other thing I want to say finally about communicating faith online is this talk about god not about yourself by all means share your personal stories but talk about god about prayer about the spiritual life and don't try to be too trendy because trendiness in this world comes across as lack of authenticity and that's another lesson that i've learned in the last 12 months don't try and be too clever because in terms of people thinking about faith, they have read too many scare stories about people ripping them off by being trendy. So the more sophisticated you can look, the less likely I think you are to be believed.
And that's a bit of a challenge because we all want to do things to the best of our ability, don't we? So that's my starting point. Thanks, Lizzie. That's amazing. There's so much in there, John. It was like I was chatting to my husband the other day, literally about the our website. And I was kind of like, oh, do we need to put, you know, where do we put the statement of beliefs? And he was like, no one, if no one's going to read that, like if, if, because it's trying to design a website for people who aren't Christians, because that is who we're there for. And and I think it is often we forget who our audience is. We we think about what we would want to read, but it's oh. it's it's all about thinking like who who are you trying to connect with? What's important to them? And and understanding that context as well, which is like a really key part of fresh expressions is is looking at the context first. Um, and 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 yeah, authenticity again. Oh. We've got. Um, uh Matthew saying like here 100 percent authenticity is hugely important in social media which in some ways sounds ironic when you think about all the the airbrushing and the the um influences but um I think that's where as Christians we can genuinely be authentic because our value doesn't come from likes and shares and comments it comes from like knowing who we are in God and so we we can demonstrate perhaps a far more authentic version of authenticity than uh than maybe we see in in other spaces um with other accounts and stuff but um i know like we we've done live we've done a lot of live streaming with our church to kind of keep it authentic so if something goes wrong it it is genuine it's not it's not really slick um and polished and and i think you're right john people connect with that and that that would be a great thing to maybe follow up on later um so uh yeah if we move on Frida um yeah it'd be great to to hear from you and hear some of your uh, reflections on this topic as well I'll just move you into the big spot oh, there we go <laughs> thank you Lizzie and also thank you Steve for bringing this video because uh in your chapter in this book you write about her and I actually used uh, that example uh, quite sometimes in the Swedish context when I lecture about the digital world because uh, in my uh, Lutheran context in Sweden we have lots and lots of people like this this girl this Kimberly uh, we have a very high degree of people that belong to the Lutheran church but they don't believe belongers but don't believers we even have a name for them the yellow group where green is the small group that is very active and then we have a very large group that is yellow belonging but passive positive but passive and then uh, the red group which is uh, negative um and there this issue about how to to reach the yellow group has been a, a increasingly important uh, issue in, in switch church and um the digital uh, environment hasn't been the strong arm of the Swedish context, in the Swedish context, not in the Lutheran church or in any other churches in the Swedish context. But as the uh, pandemic came along, uh, churches have increasingly found this space. And uh, there has been surveys done which show that to this yellow group, the online services has been very important. I used to talk about them like uh, Sakaios people. You know, he climbed a tree to have a look. He's curious. He just wants to see what's going on. Uh, and then he, he in encounters Jesus. And um, we have a lot of people like Kimberly uh, right now in Sweden who kind of climbs the tree, have a look in, and through the online services and, and, and online initiatives, uh, they, they can also meet um, Jesus uh, and find a way into the local church as well. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that video here as well. Uh, when when I prepared for this, uh, I started wondering why they put us together, the four of us, <laughs> in this seminar. And uh, one of the things I saw in our texts and also from Rachel's uh, lecture, which I remember as absolutely brilliant, uh, is the historical perspective. Um, and I think that is quite an important perspective to, to put on this issue, because when we do evangelism in, in a digital age, we tend to focus on everything that is new and, and how, how should we do this is a new field, but, but how, how, how. Uh, but the historical perspective kind of helps us to sort out what is 
really knew about this. And I think it's very little. <laughs> Uh, the use of new media, well, it's not a new thing in church. We have been taking on new media to evangelize all through church history for 2,000 years, quite successfully as well. Uh, our feelings towards this and the arguments uh, for doing this or not doing that, it's not new either. The strategies we use uh, or the intercultural approach that, that Steve talked about, it's not new. The theology that grows out of the experience from the digital space, it's not new, it's rather a rediscovery of theological resources and doctrines. So I, I think that is something really important to point to uh, in, in this, that churches already have a lot of the tools, a lot of resources to do, to evangelize this uh, in the digital context. Um, I also wanted to say something about a, a concept that I have found very useful and I also shared in the Swedish context and uh, it's, it's been useful uh, to, to help kind of conceive of how to evangelize in a, in a good way, uh, which is the concept of orality and literacy and the digital space as a secondary reality. And uh, this concept comes from Walter Ong. Uh, I'm sure many of you heard about him. Uh, he said that, uh, there, for many thousands of years, people have lived in an oral culture where you only know what you can recall. Your memory is internal, and this affects how you can communicate. It becomes important with rhythm, rhymes, proverbs, and narratives. And also communication is highly embodied. You use your body to convey meaning, like I'm doing now. <laughs> um, and it's when you communicate, it can't be too complicated. It can't Narratives and stories tend to be very black and white. You have heroes and you have villains and so on. Uh, because you always run the risk of forgetting things. And this makes tradition very important and also sacred. So good communication is interactive. And traditioning, what is commonly known in a way that kind of suits the occasion, in a literate culture, on the other hand, you have an external memory because you can keep all the good stuff in books and also on computers and so on. So you don't have to keep them in your brain all the time. And then it becomes important with nuance, with complexity, novelty. You get the idea of the single author, the genius who writes a new thing down. You have the idea of facts, uh, copyright. Uh, you, you start to do research to kind of find out new things. And this is a good thing. It's not threatening as it would be in an oral culture because if you introduce something new, then you... Perhaps you forget some of the important stuff that you already have in your brain. Um, and the idea here is that the digital age is kind of a secondary orality. It's different from first orality, since it builds on literacy. You have the text and we have here in, in, in the chats and, and so on, and you have blogs, and which is very text-oriented, of course. But we see more and more increasingly that it becomes more of the uh, visual and the oral, um, which kind of points to things that, that is important to, to, to do because it's logical in a secondary reality with narrative, with the interactive, with this remix and reuse traditions, uh, and also the idea that knowledge is common. This is something that we share, passing on a tradition. And I think we can use this concept to kind of point to things that might be important if you want to communicate the gospel in a good way. Uh, John, you spoke about the forms in, in which we do this and the, thinking about the digital uh, space as a secondary reality or the digital culture as a secondary reality kind of points to things that could be important. Narrative, liturgy and music. Also this peer-to-peer evangelism and also interactivity it can also be used to point to some problems um, and I think that this is something we could perhaps discuss later as well because last week you touched about upon the problem with evangelism and colonization and 
Uh, I also think that one of the important and interesting issues is how to evangelize in a digital space, in a digital culture, uh, if it is a secondary reality, uh, without bringing in some of the problems from the first reality, where gender is a problem, um, public speech associated to the male, um, and so on. Um, so, well, I think I used up my five minutes. So, Lissy, perhaps you would like to pass on to Rachel. Amazing. Thank you so much, Frida. That was so helpful. And I love the image of the kind of Zacchaeus people like like having a lick from the tree um I think that's it's a fantastic illustration of I think because I, I think sometimes people kind of watching from a distance sometimes especially in a digital space is seen as a negative when actually even when Jesus was around you had the crowd um who mm. observed some left some were intrigued but it, it's always been a nature of evangelism you've always got those kind of concentric circles of, of the different engagements that that we have and it's it's the same in 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 the same in the different spaces so I think yeah it was a really it's a really lovely kind of image of that there's um there's a story here from Sweden which would be it's always great to share good news stories and from Christopher I've lately heard about a girl coming to a Lutheran church here in Sweden that had been so touched by the gospel at a funeral she was invited and started to attend an alpha course which is amazing so yeah, it, God is at work. Um, so that's brilliant. And in Sweden as well, which is amazing. Um, so Rachel, um, it'd be great to hear some of your reflections based on what um, all of these guys have been talking about and from your experience as well. Um, so I'll just put you, I'll just bring you, there you go. We'll make you big, there you go. <laughs> brilliant, thank you. Now, I wish this uh, seminar was on Friday and that's because I've been working with the Church of England and the Methodist Church on some research and we are looking into uh, what's been happening during the pandemic like who has joined us online, who has left us uh, during the time we're online, who intends to return and who doesn't re intend to return and what, what some of those reasons be. Unfortunately I have to completely can keep completely zipped shut until all of that has gone through uh, the um, the comms process, so that by tomorrow in that webinar we can um, release some of those stats. But we haven't been the only people looking at some of these things. So I've got some other things that I can just point us to to help us see perhaps some of the trends that we are picking up that are happening right now um, in society during what's happening digital. Um, there was a YouGov poll in November 2020 that's worth having a look at, which talks about the um, 16 to 24 year olds and their belief in God, that 23% of the uh, 16 to 24 year olds in this country believe in God, uh, and 13% believe in a higher power. Um, in fact, there's more of them believing that than the next age bracket up. So it looks like our Gen Z is more uh, religious from that poll than our millennials. Uh, did any of you see what the codec were doing? Um, I expect you did like they've been doing, they did six waves of, of looking at people who have been online and offline church during the pandemic. There's six waves of research that they've been doing. Um, so you can have a little look at that if you want to look at some stats because that is out and about. And the big thing with that is if you if you track them on a, on a bar chart, I don't know if you're, used to seeing um, the statistics that we often have around, uh, say, the worshipping community or the numbers of people in churches. So this is if this is a 65 year old and this is a, an 18 year old, we would kind of expect a curve like that, wouldn't we? And we've got a lot more 65 year olds and a lot less um, 18 year olds. And what seems to be being showed up within the codec research is this that we have a lot more uh, of the 18. Oh, it's, it's got it's in reverse with them. Um, what we're using here. So I, I find it quite hard to put my finger. It's like looking in a mirror. Um, we have a lot more of the younger generations than particularly the, the, the middle generations. So um, it's looking like um, Gen X is is actually quite a cynical and it may be a, a, a generation that have perhaps made a decision about church and faith and um, 
are in a there's less of them but actually our millennials and in particular our gen z are much more open and are responding um and looking at faith more of them are uh, believing in god and looking at those things now that's very interesting when you then go into a pandemic uh, which is obviously a big life crisis for everybody, both young and old. And at the same time, the church is kicked to speak, it, well, maybe kicked is not the word, dragged into the digital age. Uh, I think that's what's happened to the church in this country. We've been dragged into the digital age because of the pandemic. We've done things that we would, we've done things in probably three months that might have taken us at least three years. And I think some churches might never have got there if we're really honest. Um, and so we have, you, there's so many more churches live streaming than ever before. Um, and there's so much more accessibility. You can find something on Facebook. You can find something on YouTube. You think of the number of churches that their services are now on YouTube. So you put that together with this dynamic, which is that actually the, um, I had it around there, did I actually the 18 to 30 year olds, oh, it's all very confusing because it looks different on my screen to what I'm doing. The 18 to 30 year olds are actually really, really interested in, um, in faith. And you, you to ask what language, what would they do for anything? How would they look up, I don't know, anything, a flavor of ice cream, uh, what's happening in another country, uh, what the weather is, uh what's trending they would do all of that online so you've got this uh a generation that's asking big questions and is um interested in faith and you've got a church that has been pushed to speak their language we should expect to see something really positive when those two things happen and i think um that is what we that's what we're seeing now um some of the some of the polls we, we we're just going through all our data working out what wobble factor there is uh, there's other polls that you might find interesting what tier fund and christian aid did at the beginning of the pandemic around prayer um, and practices around that and it's and then there's this the codec one there's also uh, did anyone see the theos uh, report in 2020 on religious london which was also explaining how london is more religious than any other part of the country we're way more religious let me see i can give you those stats where is my theos yeah um so 20 is it 25% of london and 10% outside of london would be well i've got to just check i've got the right one here yeah i think that's what they're saying 25% of london is worshipping and 10% of people outside london another factor not all that worship is christian uh, a lot of that Chris, uh, that worship especially in the younger generation so the muslim population goes up when you go younger so the younger you go on that little on that little um those stats the younger you go the more of the bigger muslim population you will have in this country as well so what you find is actually in london we've got more people who are worshipping both more christians worshipping of a younger age bracket and we've also got a higher percentage of people uh, of, of other faiths um, also worshipping of a younger age bracket so this is also um if you compare this to the US, we're not tracking with with America. We are tracking differently. So if you look up around on the uh, the reports on the YouGov poll about um, Gen Z, America's Gen Z is not responding how you, the UK's Gen Z is. Now that's interesting to me because again, on a digital world, you might think that we would lose some of our um, country specific differences because we're operating on a global digital platform but actually the uk is operating differently to the us which is something i've often picked up having done talking jesus in 2015 i've often said we need to not just read the us stats and the us situation we are tracking differently and our young adults are behaving differently to to us young adults so tomorrow we're going to break down more data um just some really interesting things on who's joining and who's leaving one other thing that did hit the headlines so i am and i'd say is that some people have left the church during the pandemic and and they don't return intend to return so we've got quite a few different things. We've got uh, um, a, a, a growth in the younger age bracket who found us because we've gone online. And we've got um, we've also got a group who, who during the fact that we've gone online, ha are, don't intend to come back. And that is an impact of the pandemic and, and lots of different things. And we also would like to try and do perhaps some more qualitative studies so that we can unpack 
what's happening with those different groups in, in, in a deeper way, which we really think would serve the church at this time so that we can understand. Now, for a little bit of story, so that's stats to tell you that something, uh, basically, you know, my summary of that is something wonderful is happening in our younger generations at this time in this country. And um, that the digital force of the church to go digital is, is been the most, a biggest missionary movement um, right now that's happening at the same time uh, what what other things do i know anecdotally from stories we had an amazing guy called um uh, lynn's west from lz7 he came on our talking hope show and he was sharing about how incredible it was that um he just had so many young people when he was live streaming what he was doing actually out of his loft he turned his loft into a live studio and was just streaming like DJ and streaming music and talking to talking to them about the Christian faith and had an, a massive response, particularly around the teenage years and up into the all around Gen Z. Uh, we've we've from hope with a with Kingsgate, a church called Kingsgate in Peterborough. We've just produced something called the Wellbeing Journey. It's an eight week series to get people talking about their well-being. It goes through every aspect, well-being, emotional, uh, mental, spiritual, financial, vocational, because that's kind of what the crisis is at the moment. And we discover we've got pioneers, particularly who've picked this up, who are running it in the community, sports clubs. Um, my uh, a GP from our church is asked if we could run it with our GP chaplain. So we have a Christian um like a sort of Christian mission GP practice. And she said, you know, there's nothing else out there. There isn't a secular course that we could offer. So let, and, and I mean, quite thrilled, really, we can offer a Christian course about well-being. In Peterborough, I think they've got 23 groups in the community, in their city, who are have enlisted to do the well-being journey series. So if people are interested in that, you can find that on the wellbeingjourney.org website and have a go. Um, and I mean, again, anecdotally, a lot of people have mentioned Alpha. Uh, isn't it fantastic what's happened there? That Alpha went online. It was actually really suitable. We found that here in our church, that doing Alpha online, people have joined us. And actually, this, this, the, for whatever term, the sticking rate has been higher. People have stayed through the course because it's online. Actually, that's been easier to stick them all the way through but they're really enthusiastic when they get out the other end to meet in person because people do want a uh, real life community which is actually a trait of that younger generation desperate for community desperate to live in community desperate to to have that authentic real life piece as well that's kind of matched so uh, they're my the reflections i can give you from research that i know is out there that has helped to shape the research that we're going to be um bringing tomorrow back to you Lizzie amazing oh it's so great to hear so many stories I know from um our congregation like our we did alpha in lockdown and it was the best alpha we'd had we have grown younger um pretty much everyone that came were in their 20s and early 30s and it we did like a holy spirit morning and people were physic they were experiencing the holy spirit in their own homes and it was like it was the least hyped up think because it was on zoom you cannot hype a zoom room uh, at all it was very um normal and ordinary but then there was one lady and she said because she experienced god in her house that actually she felt like god was still with her because it had happened in her home um and it was just it was just remarkable um and it just yeah it's expanded our our expectation of how god can work through through the online space and i think i heard an interview with nikki gumbel and they were saying like they would never take alpha offline it's been yeah so surprising i think like the the response and um yeah the retention and and it's so much easier to kind of go into a zoom room than, than walk into a, a church building or something in person um so yeah, there's a few other people mentioning about Alpha Online. And so, I mean, we have we were talking before we went live about um, other examples of um, people using the, the digital space um, for evangelism. And I know, um, John, I, I know in particular, there's a project that you're a part of. I just wondered if you could share a bit more about that uh, now for, for people that are listening. I'll just, there we go. Yeah, thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, I mean, this actually is a great example, literally, of the Missio Dei, which was the title of our book, uh, which people often do a shorthand version of, say, it's, uh, you know, what is God doing out there 
and what does it mean for us to get alongside what God is doing? Um, well, two things came together in recent weeks, actually, since the beginning of this year for me. One was that great body of people who came to me through the volunteer scheme looking for spiritual care. And um, I discovered, of course, no surprises that some of them, not all of them, uh, were kind of stalking me on social media, if you like. No surprises because they'd uh, had conversations with me. And in incidentally, uh, the kind of people who they are match exactly what Rachel was saying not long ago. Most of them men, interestingly, between the ages of, I would say, about 20 and 50, say, then a big gap until people who are much, much older in their 70s and 80s uh, and even older. So uh, my anecdotal uh, experience backs up what Rachel was just talking about there. Um, anyway, one of the other things that I'm involved in is I'm the co-chair of the Mission Theology Advisory Group, which is a joint enterprise between the Church of England and churches together in Britain and Ireland. And we determined that for this year, we were going to produce a short video for each week of the year, 52 of them in all, which we would post on social media every Monday and then follow up on the rest of the days of the week with uh, written reflections based on them. Um, these videos are no longer than two minutes, so we're talking very short videos. Some people have made them on their phones, others have got cameras and so on, but they're very much of the uh, the homemade variety. They're not polished studio productions. And um, uh, three weeks ago, I guess it must have been, after we'd had probably four or five of these videos, uh, spontaneously, because none of them knew each other because of confidentiality issues and so on, I got emails from about... 14, I think, in the first place of these people who I'd been uh, talking with through the volunteer scheme. And um, they all said the same thing, saw you in the video. I'd made a video which was me taking batteries out of uh, Christmas lights and reflecting on some of these batteries are completely run down. Some of them still have half the energy left in. Some of them can be restored by being uh, recharged, et cetera, et cetera. And then did that with uh, how I was feeling, how we are feeling, and referred it to Jesus' statement about come to me and I will give you rest. OK, which you might think is, well, it is a really simple message, isn't it? Um, and they'd all watched this, these uh, 14 people who sent me messages and said, uh, we'd love to have a bit more conversation about that. Um, so we did. And uh, they were able to be introduced to each other online through this kind of environment. And uh, if I tell you that we had a conversation of not far short of an hour and a half, starting from a two minute video, I think it was actually a minute and 40 seconds or something crazy like that. Um, that actually told me a huge amount about the, the spiritual hunger and what people were actually looking for. Um, and again, as Rachel was saying, the age group of these people would again be between, I would say, 20 and 40, mid 40s, maybe something like that. Um, and they're all saying to me, oh, well, we're watching some others because one of my colleagues on the Mission Theology Advisory Group uh, did one about lost things and uh, reflected on how people are lost and so on. Um, again, a homemade video which included her dog, amongst others. And um, yeah, and, and the, the kind of authenticity has struck, come through these. Um, but as I was reflecting on that, um, one of the things that uh, the chapter that I wrote in the book, uh, which was researched by my wife, Olive, um, uh, focused on the amazing popularity of a thing called ASMR, which is a kind of meditational, reflective kind of... Um, kind of enterprise. And as I looked at a lot of those videos, I see that, you know, people are making them in their kitchen with all the sort of mess that's in the kitchen or in the back of a van or out in the garden where there's a lot of wind blowing and so on. And um, so, yeah, I, I would just want to encourage the people who are uh, watching this to, yeah, don't be afraid to put yourself out there uh, you can make a video in particular 
reflect on very op overtly on a scriptural verse or a prayer or whatever, you'll feel dead vulnerable. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, you'll not know who's going to troll you or whatever. But if my experience is anything to go by, the trolls will all be Christians and the people who uh, say, yes, I want more of this, I want to know more, are going to be the very people we feel we want to reach. So, yeah, I mean, I found myself, actually, my whole life has been taken over by all this in the last 12 months. You know, this today I have five referrals in my inbox, three of whom I've already spoken to today, and I'll speak to the rest of them after this. Um, people are desperately looking for some spiritual guidance, and they want us to talk about God. Um, I, I couldn't possibly emphasize that too much, actually. They're fed up of hearing people's opinions and perceptions, and they're not interested in us talking about ourselves unless it connects exactly with our um, experience of God. But talk about basic spiritual things like prayer, like Jesus coming alongside you, um, like lost things being found. And, yeah, uh, I, th I think this is the Missio Dei. God is definitely speaking to people through there. And if we're not out there, particularly in social media, mm. which is where we engage, because all the other stuff, and I'm, I'm not criticising live streaming services and so on, but on the whole, it's a, it's a, a theatrical experience for people watching it. Uh, social media, you have to be vulnerable. You have to put yourself out there. And, um, yeah, in my experience, be ready to encounter the blessing because you'll get a blessing from doing it as well as whoever's lives you touch. So yeah. that's my story. I just want to encourage people to do what you can and expect God to meet you at least halfway along the journey. Yeah, that's so, that's so powerful. I think, like, especially... I think one one great thing about fresh expressions is is it's a lot of ordinary people that are trying mm -hmm. stuff. So it's it's mostly lay people, and um, digital is is such a leveler. You all you need is a phone, and pretty much everyone has phone and some form of internet connection somewhere. Um, and it's also that experimentation. There's very little kind of loss in if something doesn't fly or people don't connect with it. That's mm -hmm. fine. You you just try something else and um i think again like adapting and and seeing what people engage with is, is so easy to do through social media um steve you i think in your chapter you talked about traditionally like using tracts um and then I, it made me think about instagram posts and they're like mini tracts or an instagram story but you can be mm -hmm. far more contextual and, and 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 speak to the moment so much quicker than if you had to print a tract out um and and it, it just it really helps me actually just think okay that if i think of my instagram feed as a tract what would i do on it or my instagram stories um and it, it it just it helped me see it in a different way of like communicating um but yeah have you got any steve have you got any examples uh that you'd like to share as well i, I I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things i mean I, I mean one is some resourcing that people can use um so organizations like christian vision produce a whole range mm. of videos that people can exactly do things like put on their facebook pages and stuff and there's a whole load there aimed very much a different cultural context so you may look through them and go i really don't like those five but that one's brilliant i'll put that oh. on my feed really useful they've done it done the work for you i'm also a trustee of the christian inquiry agency which is also actually has its roots in churches together um oh. and so it's in a cross-denominational thing and, and we run a website called christianity.org.uk and this is very much aimed at spiritual seekers like like Kimberly we, we were looking at earlier. Uh, and lots of people do come on the site. And at one end, it's a place to explore issues of Christianity. And we post up various pages and stuff that people can read, looking at a whole range of areas. I, I did a page last October on Halloween and how Christians might understand Halloween, uh, because a lot of people are interested in that kind of stuff. But actually, if you go in deeper, you can put in prayer requests and there'll be people who pray for you. Uh, I'm one of those people uh, uh, who will pray for people who put in prayer requests. We also employ somebody who will engage with Internet conversation via email with people who want to do that. And, and often builds up relationships with people over many years. And so we see people who come to the site 
just in, as people looking who end up in conversation and then end up as members of local churches. And, and because it's, it's cross-denominational, actually, if you have a church website or a church page, you can put that link on your site and you know you're connecting people to something very useful. Another thing I want to say is that this is kind of odd, and, and you may have heard me talk about how my job has an environmental focus. One of the things that, of course, has happened through through lockdown is people's appreciation of nature. Now, that, in one sense, sounds totally different place to the digital, but it isn't, because a lot of people's nature exploration is shared through online connection. Uh, and I'm part of the forest church movement. And one of the things I found myself doing, having planned to do uh, several uh, forest church events on the ground in Litchfield Diocese, we actually created one online that people could then take out into their own gardens with instructions for how to participate themselves. And, and we just did not know how this was going to be taken, but we got absolutely loads of really positive feedback from people who engage with this, a number of whom are really not church people. So there are some surprises out there too. Um, that's fantastic. It's so that's so helpful. Um, yeah, there's so it's great to just hear just great examples of people engaging and using online content and using it to share the good news um, of Jesus. And just as we kind of we're coming like near to the end of our conversation, there's a question here that I think a lot of people are asking and it's whether you guys have a take on it or a, some, a perspective how can we prevent the elastic snapping back to a church building based model as we obviously we have now the this um in the uk um boris johnson's laid out a plan hopefully you know obviously it's it's um it's not set in stone but um that will involve churches being able to meet back in person um yeah any thoughts on this this question is we i mean a lot of people talk about hybrid church what are your do you have any kind of thoughts on that um if we kind of go around the room uh, rachel do you want to start um uh, by kind of yeah how would you respond to that question what are your thoughts going forward really for the church and for mission we do need to stay online we need to stay hybrid things like that when we're and um, if we are streaming a service we need to remember there is lots of people watching and we need to try to connect with them so it's like come and talk in the chat there is a course online so that we're not just addressing, addressing the people who then suddenly we see in front of us but actually the people who might be watching us but we need to it, and that's going to be a thing for everyone hosting a services and also how quickly you ask them to come into the chat where where are you from today please post in the chat things like that that if we were companies we'd do really well if someone was on our site we'd know and we'd be flicking them into the chat box things like that so we need to stay hybrid we need to stay online i forgot to mention this hopespaces.com we did a prayer experience website as well that people can um share with their friends um which is quite helpful called hopespaces.com if people want to share that so we need to stay online because we're there and particularly if there's a younger generation searching this is the language that they speak fantastic that's so helpful um yeah i think engagement is really key um like whatever we do and it is um kind of it's not just numbers but it's getting people to engage um and like you say like asking questions getting people to post our dog yeah. is very popular when we do church stuff a lot of people ask to see our dog um whenever we we kind of do something online so i feel like she's got her own following now but um yeah it's it yeah the engagement is so important yeah. um Frida, have you got any yeah any thoughts kind of moving forward for the the church and using mm -hmm. the digital space as we go into this next uh, season? Absolutely, how to not snap back into just local church and miss out on the digital one? Yeah, uh, well, the big Swedish survey that was made uh, in the framework of, of the uh, contact survey showed that uh, some of the most important things was the resources, of course. Uh, one of the most fundamental things was that there were resources both economical but also a team of people who could help carry each other and uh, just to, to continue doing uh, digital services and digital initiatives in, in different ways uh, and the other thing was the attitude of the church leaders the vicars of course in the local church but also the bishops and so on uh, we have this amazing initiative now in the diocese of stockholm in sweden uh, initiated by the bishop of the diocese uh, how to keep the digital doors of the church open and i think that's one of th that's really a 
key thing to make this happen resources and also church leaders who kind of encourage this and also working as a team there was one of the comments in the in the feed that i thought was so brilliant uh, isn't one of the keys to lift our efforts from my church growth to kingdom growth mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. working together um, as as churches and, and kind of pass <laughs> over that my, my local church uh, thing it, it, it's it's key also to to and not snap back into just doing local church yeah no that's so important it's like as you're sowing that seed online you have the potential to reach a lot more people but it mm -hmm. it's it's kind of being generous with with what we have and with the message right yeah it, it doesn't yeah. mean that that's they'll come to your that. church or like the, the, yeah mm -hmm. just kind of sharing sharing the good news um steve um yeah any thoughts kind of following on from from Frida's comments? I mean, firstly, because of my, my job involves me talking with quite a lot of local church leaders, I find that most of them do not want to snap back. What they fear is they won't be able to sustain it. Um, so I think how we resource churches to really help them do this well is a key issue. I also hope that we don't just think about things like streamed worship and things like that though I do want to see those happen. What I really hope is that people get to grips with engaging with various social media platforms and things like that online and, and work out how to have a good presence there. I, I, th I find very often in the church, there's a really unhelpful attitude in which those are treated as entertainment rather than real relationships. And I get very, very concerned when people tell me they're giving up Facebook for Lent or something like that, as if it was eating chocolate rather than having relationships with real people <laughs> that's so like that's that's pretty yeah there's a lot of people go on social media fasts um uh, but no i think i think that's so helpful i think like with church lead, there is a lot of fear over like how to do both and i think that's so important and, and it's encouraging and, and building each other up rather than kind of criticizing um i think in kind of sharing best practice and and supporting each other in, in trying to do the next thing um but yeah, no, that's really that's really really helpful, and it is it's seeing those people as as valuable relationships um, that you can have online. It, it sounds like TikTok is is a great opportunity um, for evangelism um, and connecting with people, and that seems to have grown a lot. And I've heard of Christians using TikTok and engaging with like just thousands of people um, through that platform. So I think yeah, it's 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 staying yeah open to trying new things um definitely and then john finally yeah what what would be your thoughts kind of as we finish about this moving mm. into this next moment and not snapping back i think if we were having this conversation in 12 months time i think one of the major components would be people asking why did so few people come back to church once we were able to open and i think that a lot of people who, who are building up their hopes that all these thousands of people who they reckon have watched their live stream services will show up in person. Um, so I think we're going to need a much more radical in the sense of going back to the roots, not being trendy radical, um, going back to the roots, asking fundamental questions. What is church? Um, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And how does any of this work? in relation to the constraints and opportunities of um, life the way we live it. Um, I mean, looking at the group that I mentioned, who uh, talked about the videos I mentioned earlier, um, none of them live within any reasonable distance of each other. So by definition, if they are to become a congregation, a, a faith community, um, it, will, it will not be by physical meet, meeting. But I'm pretty certain that a lot of people are going to be really disappointed when they see how few people return. And I think that um, for me personally, I, I'm expecting to have to hold a lot of people's hands um, and be generous with them and uh, not say, I told you so, but uh, journey with people who are actually going to be hurting quite significantly because, as Steve says, they've done their best to get through this pandemic. And, um, yep, I, I just see this as a big pastoral issue for um, Christian leadership in, in the next 12 months or so as we emerge out of 
not into getting back to normal, actually. We'll be emerging into a, not even a new normal. It'll be a new different. And I think we'll be reinventing a lot of things in a completely different way than uh, than we've been accustomed to. Um, you know, I, I've dipped into so many services around the world, just out of curiosity, that I bet I'm billed as a potential convert in thousands of churches around the world. I will not be showing up, you know, <laughs> And and I suspect I'm not the only one by a long way. Yeah. But I'm yeah. hearing the same from regular congregants actually, who are saying, Yeah, I've discovered I can do without it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. No, it's it's so it that's really helpful i think like lockdown made us very uncomfortable and we want to go back to to what we know but i think maybe we need to remain uncomfortable for a bit longer to 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 kind of embrace what god's doing rather than what we think he should be doing um in this next season um we've got elaine smith bishop mike harrison being locally known as a tiktok bishop that is true and actually bishop mike harrison has just joined the fresh expressions board of trustees so i'm hoping he's going to teach me some tiktok moves the next uh, board meeting that we have um but <laughs> so, um but on that note um, just thank you so much for giving your time today and just um contributing to like your your experience your research um sharing examples of um yeah like where god is at work in the digital space and thinking about evangelism in in that space as well because it's just it's just a vital part of of our ministry um moving forward but also just so many good news stories as well it's not it can be seen as a negative uh things sometimes the digital space but but god is at work and there are so many great stories of him moving in people's lives so mm -hmm. thank you so much um if you'd like to get a copy of the missio day book you can do so it's scm press there you go frida uh, frida's got a little uh um she's showing her other and john excellent um and you can get there's a discount if you go to the top of the feed there is a discount code you can put in if you go onto scm press and um you will get uh, i think it's 15 percent off which is a bargain um and it's a great book and we've got the final of the three parts of these conversations happening next thursday at 1 p.m and it's looking at um missio day um post in a post-covid world um which will be really interesting kind of following on probably a lot from kind of what we've we've started to talk about uh this week so yeah thank you so much and um do if you also there's a link to the newsletter if you want to um become part of fresh expressions find out what we're doing and what's coming up if you um sign up to the newsletter then you'll get all that information and you can like and follow us on um social media as well so thank you guys i'll let you get back to your afternoon and we will see you soon goodbye